Um, so good morning. Today's, uh, today's topic is um, matrix models slash recommender systems. They're sort of a setting and a um, type of model that are quite intimately related, so we'll go through both of them. Uh, and most of what I'm going to talk about comes from this paper, Matrix Factorization Techniques for Recommender Systems by Yehuda Koren, which is a very nice, uh, gentle introduction to the subject. Uh, it's not um, required reading, but it is recommended reading. So if you find this interesting or you think it might be useful for something, then I recommend starting with this paper. Uh, this is the plan. So I'll start, talking by, uh, start by talking about recommender systems. which are just another kind of machine learning task, a little bit like classification or regression. And then we'll discuss uh, matrix models. Specifically matrix factorization models, oh yeah, matrix factorization as I've called it there, uh, which is sort of the most popular framework to use to solve um, these recommender systems problems. Uh, so, um, before the break, I'll discuss the basic principle and how it works uh, in its simplest form, and then we'll discuss a few extensions, a few ways to make it better and to make it actually deal with uh, real-world problems, specifically regularization, adding biases, and adding side information. And finally, if there's time, we will revisit our discussion of PCA, principal component analysis, which is a, uh, actually sort of a, a matrix model in itself. So it's kind of the first matrix factorization model that we uh, saw. Uh, so we'll briefly revisit it and we'll connect the dots there. Uh, I think the field started in earnest in 2006 uh, when Netflix, which was then a um, DVD rental company, that's how they're described in the paper. Uh, I don't think they do that anymore, but you could uh, send in a little form to Netflix and they would email you a DVD, uh, uh, not email, they would mail you a DVD over regular old snail mail. And then you could watch it and send it back. Uh, so very different company then, but they did already have a rating system. So their users, they could rate movies and then they could, uh, the Netflix could recommend them new movies, which is even more important these days. Uh, and they weren't very happy with their rating system. So what they did, uh, well, they looked at the field and said, why is this so difficult? Why is this not progressing? Um, there were two problems. Nobody was working on it. Nobody cared. And there wasn't any, any data. So any company that wanted to predict ratings or that wanted to recommend stuff to its users had its own data, but that was very private. That was user data, so they didn't want to share it. Um, so there was a big gap. The, 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 there, was, there were some academics working on it, but nobody had the data to really do this properly and to test this properly. So Netflix did two things. They uh, offered a prize of a million bucks. So they said, this is our system. It gets a root mean squared error of such and such. The first person or the first team who can do 10% better than that gets a million bucks. And until that ceiling has been reached, uh, the first, um, the best team every two or three years, best team in the rankings gets uh, 50,000 euros as a uh, dollars as a kind of price to keep you going. Uh, and the second thing they did, they anonymized a huge amount of their data and they made that public. So they had a huge data set, especially for these days, gigabytes of data, of uh, user rating data. So basically, a big matrix of users and movies for which very few, uh, but still a few gigabytes of data of, of ratings were filled in, where you say this movie, uh, this user rated this movie in this way. And they had a five-star rating system back then. 
and they changed it now, but they had five stars. So you could give a movie one star, two, three, four, or five stars. Uh, that's called an F explicit feedback system. So you gather explicit feedback from your users. You just ask them, did you like this movie? Yes or no? Or how, how much did you like this movie? Um, and it gives you this kind of data set, big matrix with your users on one side and your movies on the other side. And this is what Netflix gave us, plus the incentives of a lot of money. Um, and so that uh, really sort of well, uh, gave birth to this field of recommender systems, which are now some of the most uh, commonly used machine learning systems in the world. And the Netflix challenge, I think, was purely on, on the basis of explicit information, but you can also use implicit information. So if you, have, if you are Netflix or you have some other um, company where users watch things or consume media, um, you can look at things like uh, page views, like what pages did they visit. Like on Netflix, if I look at the synopsis of a movie, but I don't watch it or rate it, you can still infer something from that, maybe that I might be interested. or uh, So you can take that as a kind of implicit feedback on the movie and try and learn something from that. Uh, you have wish lists. You can let, uh, make people use wish lists, and that's not just a feature that's easy for the users. That's actually also a feature that's very useful for the people running the website because they get these kinds of uh, links between users and items. Uh, you can look at uh, similarity between movies and between users. So if I if you don't know whether or not I like this movie, but you know I like this other movie that's very similar to it, then you can infer a little bit. And what people even do is record, record uh, cursor movements. So if, I'm, if I go to a certain website and I hover over a movie and then I think, now nah, forget about it, if the website has a little JavaScript uh, thing running that records my cursor, uh, they can actually see that I, they can still infer that I was interested. Um, not everybody does it, but you can even do that. And then there's side information, which you can also integrate, which are basically the features as we've seen them uh, so far. So you have the features about users. You can get their country, their language, their operating system, login times, a little biographical uh, details. Um, you can crawl their social media profile for anything you like. You can get their picture, whatever. And for movies also, well, just think of IMDb for any movie, you can get a huge amount of data and you can work that into a feature vector somehow. So this is basically just representing movies and uh, users the way we've been representing things throughout the course as a fe vector of features. But this needs to integrate somehow with these explicit ratings that we're also going to use, and implicit ratings. So that's sort of the task. It's not just useful for Netflix. Uh, obviously, if you're selling other things than movies, like Amazon, you can also give recommendations. Amazon was probably the first company to really give uh, recommendations successfully and, and very insistently. Uh, they became quite famous for it for a while. Uh, so they do this kind of thing, recommended for you. And basically, any web shop you see now will have this kind of bar that says recommended for you. If you click on one of their things, you are immediately profiled and given recommendations. Uh, but even outside the sphere of commerce, things like uh, Google News has a personalization feature, uh, not a very good one, uh, but they do. Uh, so the, the basic principle here is also that you can have, you can profile your users and profile your news stories and see if you can map them together, see if you can give people the kind of news that they're interested in. So I might be more interested in, in technology news than health news, for instance. Uh, so you can profile that and see if you can give, give me a bit more technology in my newsfeed. Uh, other companies, uh, Twitter is a very interesting case. So they used to just, and I think Facebook does this as well, they used to just show you a timeline of chronologically ordered tweets, things that have happened uh, that people have posted that you are s subscribed to. Uh, but now they kind of reorder that a little bit. So if a tweet is particularly interesting or if a Facebook post is particularly interesting and they think, well, you don't want to miss this one, they keep it on top of your timeline a little bit longer. 
And if you log in, even if it's a day after it's been posted, you still see it at the top of the page. You still see it first. So you, there you, again, you need a recommender system. You need to know which tweets are interesting and which tweets are interesting to which people. And Spotify, uh, again, I don't use it myself, but apparently they also have quite a, an interesting recommender system. So basically, if you have any kind of company, any kind of users that you want to connect with things in your database, in your content database, a recommender system is uh, sort of the way to go. Uh, but even if you don't have users, if you don't have people, there are cases, uh, there are lots of other cases where uh, at least the, the techniques of recommender systems, like matrix factorization, still apply. So basically anywhere where you have this kind of structure to your data, where you have some subjects that has some property, that ha uh, which is some object, if you followed the uh, knowledge engineering course, you'll know this as a triple. Um, basically, if you have a lot of different things here and a lot of different things here, but finite sets, like users and movies, then this matrix uh, factorization is applicable. So um, some of you may have, uh, some of you have been doing the Kaggle, I think it's called the What's Cooking Challenge. I heard you talking about it earlier, right? Um, where you basically have, I don't know what the challenge is, but you basically have a lot of recipes and a lot of ingredients. So it's thousands of recipes, thousands of ingredients, which is technically a categorical feature, right? Technically an ingredient is a category, but there's 3,000 categories. So you can't really treat it as a, the same way you would a, a three category feature. It's kind of difficult to simplify. Um, but you also don't want to map it to integers because there's no ordering. There's no logical ordering to ingredients. Uh, so what you can do is, as it were, treat recipes as users and ingredients as uh, as movies, as it were, or the other way around, doesn't really matter, and use some of these uh, recommender system techniques, and you get you can get very good representations. Uh, if you're thinking, oh great, now he tells us, basically it's the same as, it works out as being the same as PPA, so it's sort of, uh, uh, it's not that different from what you've been told already. Uh, or you can sort of try and predict uh, which politician vote, voted for which law or is going to vote for which law. Or you can even have people on both sides. So if you have a social network where users interact with each other, follow each other, then you can recommend who should I follow on Twitter and stuff like that. So in summary, uh, we'll stick for now, I mean, I said you, can, you don't need users, you can do it on lots of things, but for now we'll stick with users and movies or users and items. Just to make it a bit more concrete. So we get a big bag of users, we get a big bag of items, and these are income, uh, and we get some ratings. So for some users, have some users have told us for some items whether or not they like them either on a five-star rating, either by pushing a like button, so sometimes you just have zero or one, or with a, a plus one or minus one, so positive, negative, uh, like, dislike, I think Facebook has that these days. But uh, crucially, it's very incomplete. We don't have it for all items and users. In fact, for most combinations of an item and a user, we don't have a rating. And we don't even want that because it would be too big probably to store. If Facebook stored a rating for every user and every item it had, there wouldn't be a computer on the world, in the world, a data center in the world big enough to store all that data. So you don't want all of the data. You want a subset for the ones that matter. Um, and you have some implicit ratings for the cases where you don't have enough data in a certain section. You can get some implicit ratings, but again, these are incomplete. You have some side information about your users and about your items. Well, you may or may not have some side information. We won't talk about side information until the second half. And the side information may or may not be complete. So Netflix can assume that they have pretty complete information about all their movies, or they can ensure that that's the case. Uh, but Facebook certainly won't have complete information about anything that you can like on the internet. And then the task is to predict how user you would rate item I on whatever scale you're using. Let's say one to five. And then we have a test set of true ratings and we compute the difference in squared error 
and that's usually what we want to minimize. So that's the task. And the most popular way to solve that is through um, matrix factorization or matrix models. And to explain this, let's go to, uh, let's uh, pretend we are in an extremely simple world where movies have just two genres, action or romance, and these are mutually exclusive. So a movie is either an action movie entirely, zero or one, or a romance movie entirely. And men are either, uh, or people are either male or female, zero or one entirely. And uh, men always like action movies and never like romance movies, and women always like romance movies and never like action movies. Like I said, it's a simplified uh, thing. It's not a reflection of how things are, but uh, just to explain the principle. So knowing this, uh, let's assume also that we know how this, uh, uh, that this is true. We know that this is the case. We can represent each user with a vector uh, like this, so the row vector like this, indicating whether or not they are male or female. And we can uh, indicate each movie with a, a row vector like this, indicating whether it's an action movie or a romance movie. And now our prediction, the logic, uh, using the logic I've just described, is simply the in product or the dot product of these two vectors. So if I have a user u and a movie i, just take their dot product, and if this is one and this is one and this is zero and this is zero, and we multiply them and sum them, and we get a one, so the user likes the movie because these two features align, and if they don't align, so we have a man with a romance movie, I think it was, yeah, then they won't like it. And then our ratings matrix, if this were true, our ratings matrix is just essentially the uh, matrix U of all users times the matrix M of all movies. Because remember, matrix multiplication, if we multiply two matrices, then the uh, cell here in the result is the dot product of this column and this row. And this cell is the dot product of this row and this column. So our rating matrix is essentially the dot product of these back. Um, now, obviously, not all movies are either romance or. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so the question, the question is, what exactly um, is the idea here? Um, these are two separate matrices. So uh, this is a matrix with features on the columns and users on the rows. So they're also, they're different uh, lengths, as you can see here. This is a matrix with features on the columns and movies on the rows. So thank you, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, that's a obviously very simplified view. Not all movies can be categorized in this way. Uh, not all movie preferences can be categorized in this way. And even gender um, comes with its, uh, with its wide range of uh, exceptions. Um, so clearly this isn't realistic, but this is a good principle to go on. So what we do is we extend it a little bit. We give each user a number of features, numeric features. And we allow negative values, so they are somewhere between negative infinity and positive infinity. And this vector somehow represents a user. We'll leave it up in the air exactly how that works for now. And we do the same thing for a movie, so we get a vector of the same length, that's important, because we're taking the dot product, that somehow represents this movie. And the bigger the dot product, the more this user likes this movie. And essentially, the way you can interpret these properties or these, these features is that this feature K here represents a property of a movie. And if the movie has that property a lot, like it's very romantic, then that uh, value is very high. And if the movie is not romantic at all, then the value is very low. And then the user also has a corresponding feature that indicates how much they value that feature in the movie. 
that this is very high, the user loves romantic, uh, loves romantic movies, and if this value is very low, they hate romantic movies. And then we can do the same thing again. So here we have a matrix U and a matrix M. And we use uh, column vectors. So uh, this is UT, U transformed, to put it uh, on its edge. And our rating matrix is now the result of these two things. So if we were to uh, do this by hand, if we could describe by hand all the movies and all the users, then we could predict the rating matrix. We could just multiply them and get a rating matrix. Or if that's too big to store in memory, we can just pick the vector for some movie that we're interested in and the user that's just logged on and compute the in product to do that on the fly. That's also possible. Uh, but the problem is we want to do it the other way around, right? We have the rating matrix, but we don't have this and we don't have this. So we want to factor the matrix. A factor is a, an element of a multiplication. So to factorize something is to write it as a multiplication. So we want to write the matrix as the multiplication of two other matrices, like this. Uh, now, if we know M, let's just simplify things a little bit. And you can, this is reasonably practical. You could just come up with these features. You could just, if you're Netflix, you could just say, well, we pick uh, 15 features. Uh, how romantic is it? How uh, worthy is it? How long is it? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we just fill this in. We get a bunch of interns to go through our database and fill all these in by hand. And then we get matrix M explicitly written from our interns, and we have some ratings from our users. And then the problem becomes very simple to solve. So we're looking for this. Uh, uh, the only thing we don't have is u, so we're looking for a u such that r equals ut times m as closely as possible. So we're looking to, in, uh, to, to set the values of u such that this is as close to true as possible. In other words, uh, R minus UTM should have a low norm. Uh, this incidentally is the uh, what's called the Frobenius norm, which is a bit uh, um, it sounds very fancy, but it's not. Uh, it's not. It's basically the matrix norm, but applied to uh, sorry uh, a vector norm, but applied to matrices. So you know if you have a vector. like this, then the norm is a squared plus b squared and the square root of that. If you just do this, but for all the elements in your matrix, so you get a big sum of all the squares in your matrix and you take the square root of that, uh, that's your Frobenius norm. So that this basically gives us a least squares optimization objective for how far UTM is away from R. Uh, that's called a, uh, this is called the general linear, mo linear model, which works out. We won't go through it, but you can actually work this out. And it turns out that if you take the pseudo inverse of M, which is a particular kind of matrix operation, you times it by R, you get a good solution. Which is not surprising because if R UTM, if these were... Um, numbers instead of matrices, and I asked you to solve it for you, uh, then this would be just multiplication, of course. Uh, you would end up with this, which is essentially what we've ended up with in matrix land as well. So u is equal to the inverse of m times r. So in summary, if we know m, this is a very simple problem, and we can solve it directly using uh, least squares optimization. But we have two problems. Firstly, we have a lot of missing values in R. Uh, so what we're doing here, essentially, implicitly, I haven't really uh, mentioned that, but what we're doing here is we are assuming that all the uh, values missing in R are zeros, which is not strictly true, because, we, because they're missing. They might be zero, they might be one, they might be anything. Um, so if you just fill them in with zeros, you are optimizing a lot for a lot of the missing values in your matrix. Uh, 
uh, which you don't really want to do because it puts pressure on the wrong part of your problem. And the second thing is that uh, designing M by hand and filling it in by hand, uh, it can be done, certainly if you're a company as big as Netflix, but you don't really want to do that. Firstly, because you can't be sure that you are picking the right features and that you are giving the right values to solve this problem as good as you can. And secondly, um, well, you have to keep doing this for every new movie that comes in, of course. Well, if you're Netflix, that doesn't really matter. Um, but if you're something like uh, a company like Facebook or Amazon, then you have a very diverse database, and you might get some books. So you give a feature, how romantic is this book, and you fill that in by hand. But then your same matrix of things also has nonfiction books, and then suddenly that feature doesn't apply anymore. So you need new features, and then you get movies, and then you get music videos and stuff like that. If you're Facebook, you can get anything on the internet. So this, it's very difficult to figure out one feature matrix or one, uh, one set of features that captures basically all the items in your data. So it would be much nicer if you could leave U open and leave M open, and just set this number, set their size, um, and work both of them out from the data. Uh, Oh, sorry, going slightly back to missing values. So this is what your matrix looks like. It doesn't look like this big filled-in thing. Basically, you get a very sparse layout of the uh, ratings that are actually given. So to solve that, to solve both those problems, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going all over the place. So focus on missing values first. To solve the missing value problem, you optimize only for the known ratings. So instead of doing this matrix multiplication and using this Frobenius norm to optimize, you just sum over all the ratings that you know. Uh, you take the rating that is known, which we will call, call RUI, so the rating that we know user U gave to item I. We compute this dot product, which gives our predicted rating. You take the difference between the two, you square it, and you sum it over all these known ratings. And that will be your error that you're trying to minimize. And like I said, we want to learn both M and U. So actually, we are not just minimizing over U, we are minimizing over U and M together. Uh, we're already well into matrix models. Um, so use U is a vector PU with F elements. U, movie I is a vector QI with F elements. And we want to minimize this. This is our final goal. So now we need a search algorithm. We need a way to figure out how to set these PUs and QIs for all users and all movies, so pretty big matrices, um, in such a way that this value is as small as possible. Uh, we've done so far, we've always done this with stochastic gradient descent. And this is no exception. You can do this with stochastic gradient descent as well, and that's probably the best way to do it. In the sense that it's the most um, flexible. It's the easiest to adapt the algorithm and still get a workable search algorithm. Uh, so if you work out the uh, gradients for this value with respect to P, U, and Q, I, well, the first thing to note is that this, for any given U and I, there is only one term in this sum that depends on them. So if you take the derivative of this with a specific u and i, all the terms in this sum disappear except one, where those u and i, uh, uh, for, that, yeah, for that specific rating, the term that corresponds to that specific rating between that user and that movie. Uh, you take the derivative of that and you essentially end up with this. So you set some value e u i, the error, to this, to this uh, residual. And uh, I've actually taken two steps. So this is the stochastic gradient descent algorithm already. So this is the gradient here next to the eta. So this error times PU is the update for QI. And this error times QI is the update for PU, which basically makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, because this is the... Uh, the vector that represents the movie, 
that says, for instance, this movie is very romantic. And if the error tells us that we should, uh, so if the error is positive, uh, so it tells us that we should update the movie, uh, the use, uh, sorry, let's say, th so this is the vector representing the movie. If the error is positive, it tells us that we should update the user to be more like the movie, uh, proportional to the error. So we take a little bit of the movie vector and we add it to the user vector. So they become more alike. And likewise, with the other one. Um, so these are the update, the basic update uh, equations for stochastic gradient descent. Uh, eta here is the learning rate, if you remember from stochastic gradient descent. So this is a hyperparameter that you set yourself that controls how quickly the algorithm converges. Um, sometimes you have positive and negative ra ratings in equal number and you can just use this. Sometimes you only have positive ratings. So a lot of these uh, websites have only a like button, which is basically the most elegant way to do it, I think. But um, it gives you kind of a problem because you only have positive examples. You don't have negative examples. So what you then do often is you sample negative examples. So you just sample a random movie and a user, random user and you assume that positive ratings are much less likely than uh, negative ratings, which is usually true. Usually this is a sparsely connected uh, graph, the rating graph. Um, and under that assumption, you can just sample randomly to get negative examples. You just sample a random bunch of uh, users and movies, pair them up, and you set those to negative. You train the system to, uh, uh, yeah, you use those as negative uh, training examples. So the R U is uh, zero, for instance. So that's just a trick that, that's often used. Um, but uh, stochastic gradient descent is not the only way to do this. Uh, remember that I said that if you know M, then it's very easy to compute U. Likewise, if you know u, then it's very easy to compute m. So we can use the same sort of logic that we use in the EM algorithm and just optimize the two. So we initialize them randomly, starting with random u and m. We fix m, compute a new u. We fix u and compute a new m, and we optimize this until it converges. Uh, so it's just an alt uh, alternative way of doing it. Uh, which is called alternating least squares, alternating optimization, like um, expectation maximization. Um, and in some cases, this converges faster or is more efficient. So here's the result. If you do this on the Netflix data set, I don't know if you hope you can read this. If you do this on the Netflix data set, and you look at the uh, first two uh, features, so the two most, the two features on the movies that explain most of the variance, as it were, in, 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 uh, as in PCA. Uh, the two primary uh, feature vectors, factor vectors, they call them here. And you see, then you can plot all the movies and see how they're arranged in this space. Uh, what you can see is that it, uh, it's, it's quite a meaningful arrangement. So you have quite uh, worthy movies here, like Citizen Kane and Sophie's Choice and not quite so worthy movies like Freddy Got Fingered and Half Baked and stuff like that. And then sort of in the middle here, between, right here there are quite quirky movies, so slightly worthy but also slightly um, maybe pulpy, like, uh, can't quite read, so you have Royal, Royal Ten Tenenbaums and Punch Drunk Love, which are sort of art housey uh, movies. And then in between there and the the sort of, uh, well, I don't want to call it low quality, but, but unworthy movies. There are sort of art house movies focused on violence, like Kill Bill, Natural Born Killers, or Scarface. Uh, and here you get the romantic movies. So just with two features, you get quite a nice clustering of, of genres and, and movies. And remember, uh, the only thing we've used here is the user ratings. We don't know anything about these movies. We've not used any side information. We, uh, all these movies are to us are columns in a matrix. And all we know about each movie 
is that some user called user 10 rated this high and some user called user 20 rated this low. We don't know anything about users, we don't know anything about movies, but we can still get this kind of semantic clustering from them. Uh, final thing before the break to mention is that validation, as usual, we move to a new setting, our validation setting changes, uh, our validation uh, protocol changes. Uh, this is, uh, oh yeah, I stole this from uh, somebody called Alex Williams. This is a very good blog post. Uh, read it if you have the time or if you ever do anything with this uh, kind of stuff. Basically, this is validation in our normal setting. Don't look at the notation. He uses different letters than I. This is your data matrix. These are your weights and these are your outpu outputs. So this is basic uh, linear regression. You multiply your item by your weights and you get some output. And then what you can do is, if you want to do validation or testing, you hold out some data. So some rows in your data matrix, you delete. Your data matrix gets smaller, but your model stays the same size. And you can take these things that you held out and you can use them later to validate and to test. And that's what we've been doing so far all the time. But now we have this matrix factorization model where we have these two uh, matrices that uh, need to multiply to become the data. If we now hold out a row of our data like we did before, we have a problem. Because these two multiplied by each other uh, are a different size. So if this is a user, we've suddenly removed all information from one user from the data. And then during testing, we suddenly have to predict for that user what they like, which is very unrealistic and it doesn't doesn't fit, doesn't fit this matrix uh, factorization approach. Um, and the same thing <coughs> for columns. If we remove a bunch, bunch of movies from our data, then we don't have any information about those movies during testing to test on. So testing doesn't work. Um, and essentially this is because what we're doing is we are, um, we are using the columns as features for the users, right? We don't know anything about the users until we start talking about site information. We don't know anything about the users except which movies they've rated, which is like a big feature matrix. You can think of this as a big feature matrix where all the movies are features and the, uh, the feature values for every user are whether or not they like that movie. But we do it the, in the opposite direction as well. So we don't know anything about the movies and the feature factors for our movies are which users like them. So we have this kind of weird mixture of features in two directions. Our basically, our, our rating matrix is a data matrix like this, but it's also a data matrix like that. Um, so what you do, just to give you the punchline here, is you take this list of ratings that you have and you withhold some of those. So you don't withhold any movies fully and you don't withhold any users fully, but you withhold some ratings. Ideally, in such a way that you uh, still have some values in every column and still have some values in every row. And if you want to do both testing and validation, of course, you withhold some test data and some uh, you withhold some test data, the blue ones. And you split the rest into a validation and a training set, and you can do cross validation on that. So you can do that multiple times. And then you can do testing and uh, validation on uh, a matrix factorization model. So that's all I had about the basic principles of matrix models. Let's have a quick break, 15 minutes, and afterwards we are going to start talking about regularization and biases. Uh, yeah, b uh, before we uh, get started with regularization, I uh, had some good uh, good questions uh, during the break, um, so thanks for that, first of all. Uh, and I think there's something I skipped over a little bit too fast, or I made slightly too many big leaps here, uh, which does happen. So let's uh, briefly review exactly what I meant by this. So we have a task, we have some users, we have some... Uh, uh, items and we want to predict these ratings. So I started with that, this very simplified example, the simplified world where um, 
people are always men and always women and movies are always action and or uh, romance. Uh, and we know these preferences explicitly. So we know how the world works in this scenario. So not only do we know what features we should assign to users, we know what features we should assign to movies, we also know how these features interact to create a certain rating. So that's none of that's true in the real world, but we're just assuming this to simplify it and to explain the principle. We get a matrix where each row is a user and we get a matrix where each row is a movie. So these matrix matrices are not connected. We're not saying this user rated this or anything like that. We just have the users and we have the movies. And in this scenario, we don't need to know any ratings. We're not learning anything. We assume we know how the world works. And we're just computing the ratings because we know how people rate movies. And in that setting, we can just if we have a user here and a movie here, we can just take the rate, uh, the features from that user and the features from that movie, take the dot product and produce the rating. And really the only thing I'm saying here is, this is why we think dot product, why, why we think if you have something, some feature describing a user and some feature describing a movie, this is why we think the dot product is a good way of combining those to create a rating, right? Because this kind of principle works. And of course, in the real world, we don't know what makes what good features are. And in the real world, we don't know how to represent users. So we need to do this the other way around. So this is our simplified example where we can just multiply out these matrices and predict all the ratings. We don't know how to do that in the real world. So we need to turn this problem around. What we do is we set some features. We pick a number like six. We set the users, uh, we represent the users by a vector, but we don't know what that vector is going to be because now we don't know how to represent the user. We don't know what the feature should be. And the only thing we say is that the user and the movie have the same number of features. And in some higher sense, we think, well, a, a proper a feature corresponds roughly to a property on a movie, well, how much a movie has that property, like how romantic it is. And the corresponding feature on the user vector corresponds to how much that user values that property. And if that's true, and if we can learn some numbers to put in these boxes, then taking the dot product makes for a, uh, gives us a good prediction for a rating. And then we get this view where these mat where the uh, matrix U is filled with numbers that we're going to learn representing the users. Matrix M, here every row is a user, here every column is a movie. Matrix M is filled with numbers that we're going to learn. And if we multiply these matrices, we get our predicted rating. This white spot matrix factorization. All right, so that's the sort of basic, well, that's sort of the most important point of the lecture. So I hope that uh, uh, hits home. Uh, if it doesn't, then watch the video and, and see if you uh, can work out what I mean when you see it for the second time. Um, because now we're going to talk about how the s some of the ways in which this system, this principle falls short and how to fix that. <coughs> and the first is that not all users are the, are the same. So this is, if you look at the uh, mean rating, the average rating uh, of a user and you plot it, then most users have an average rating of 3.8. But there are some very grumpy users who have an average rating of 2.2 stars. This is in the Netflix data. And there are even a few users who have an average rating of five stars, who have just simply loved everything they've seen. Just every movie they've seen, they've given it five stars. Quite unaware, apparently, that that's not really very helpful. Um, so um, you need to take this into account. If, let's say, I show a, a user a movie with uh, Tom Hanks in it, and they rate it 2.8. Well, they can't rate it 2.8, so they rate it three, let's say, three stars. For some users, 
if that's the five point if that's a five user that means they hate absolutely hated it and i probably shouldn't show them any more movies with tom hanks in it but if that's a 2.2 user it probably means he loved it and maybe i can show him more movies with tom hanks in it so that's user bias and we should take that into account how likely is the user to give a certain rating uh, you have sort of the same thing with movie bias. So uh, some movies are uh, sort of better than other movies, uh, well, uh, uh, globally. I mean, I'm not uh, saying anything about Titanic specifically. This is the kind of movie where even if you hate romantic movies, even if your feature factor says, don't show me any romantic movies, you might still want to see Titanic even though it's a very romantic movie it also won eight oscars so it's so uh, it has such a high sort of movie bias you still want to see it so we need to model these things and the simplest way to do that is with bias terms so we take a number b called the generic bias bi the movie bias bu the user bias these are just numbers for a specific uh, user and movie that express this kind of uh, bias level, how likely are they a priori, so independently of the movie, how likely is this user, uh, what's the, the average rating this user is gonna give? And you just add them to the predicted rating. So this is now our predicted rating, R hat, which used to be just uh, the dot product of PU and QI, but now we just add these things. And these can be positive and negative, they're just, you can just, uh, they just allow you to scale the value of a particular column in your mat rating matrix, a particular row in your rating matrix, or even scale your whole rating matrix up and down. And then the uh, optimization problem stays the same. So we just take the difference between our predicted rating and our actual rating for all our known ratings, uh, we sum all those squares. So that's bias. <coughs> uh, next, Regularization, uh, we talked about this earlier. Uh, so if you think back to this problem where we, uh, this uh, setting where we had the, the men and the women and the action and the romance movies, uh, an important reason that worked is that these were mutually exclusive, that you could be either man or woman or either romantic or action, but not both, which in both cases is not realistic, but, not, um, but it worked for the examples. So if we allow a user to set his own features, to tick both the male and the female boxes, that, move, that user can now like both an action and a non-action movie, and you're not getting any feedback on, uh, and if you start learning this, so if you want to learn what the user, user should be from a bunch of noisy ratings, then this is the best option for any user because you're always predicting all ratings, all likes, all ratings. So there's a massive problem with overfitting here. Uh, and in our example, what we did to remove that was to make this mutually exclusive, make these features mutu mu mutually exclusive, uh, which we don't have in our proper setting, right? In our proper setting, you can, the feature vector can be anything, so it can be plus one million in all columns. So there's a big risk of overfitting there. And overfitting we can uh, combat by regularization, which is essentially a soft version of saying that this is, uh, these should be mutually exclusive. So if we say that these should be exclusive, either man or female, then we're saying this vector should sum to one, right? Then it's exclusive or this vector should sum to one. So instead of saying the vector should sum to one, we can also say we take the sum of the vector and we add that as a penalty to the loss function. So you can have, this sum can be anything, but the bigger it is, the more you pay in your loss function. And that's basically what we've been uh, talking about earlier with regularization in our uh, previous lecture, um, Deep Learning 2, it was, where you basically say, I take the norm of all my parameters, multiplied by some hyperparameter lambda, 
and that's a penalty I pay for how big my parameter vector is. And then uh, all else being equal, the search method will prefer this kind of model to this kind of model because they are uh, the, the norm of the feature vector is smaller. Um, yeah, I think we basically cover all the slides, but I'll. Uh, so this is the, the uh, oh yeah, I'll um, go through it quickly. So this is basic idea for a very simple uh, regression model with a weight and a bias. So if this is parameter one and parameter two, then this is the norm of our parameter vector. And the bigger this is, the more penalty you pay in the loss. Um, and then we had this story where you, if you take the, the two norm, then all the models with norm one form a circle. If you take the one norm, which looks like this, just the sum of the absolute values of the parameters, then all the values of norm one form this uh, diamond shape, which is useful because if you think of your regression problem as searching for a minimum in this space or like a marble rolling down a bowl, uh, then this is what you get for L1 regularization. So if you tilt the bowl, which is what your regularization does, is what I talked about in the previous lecture, you, your marble will end up along one of these ridges. Or in other words, your solution to your search problem will end up along one of these axes. So that's L1 regularization. You can do both. For now, let's do L2 regularization. So basically, we take our loss function as it was, but we add to it for every uh, u and i, we add one of these regularization terms, just so that these numbers that we choose to represent the user and that we choose to represent the movie don't grow too big. So that's regularization and bias, just tricks to make this work better. Uh, finally, the, probably the most famous problem in recommender systems is the cold start problem, which is what happens if you get a new user. And Netflix gets probably thousands of new users every day, and probably hundreds of new movies every day over the, th the world. If you do this matrix thing, then these will be rows and columns in your matrix with only zeros. You don't know anything about the movie because er anything about the movie you know from people who have rated it. We haven't included any other information than ratings. And same for the users. If the users haven't given any ratings, you can't conclude anything about them. So that's the cold start problem. How do you start recommending people stuff so that they start watching stuff so that they start rating stuff? And then once they've rated stuff, you can recommend them new stuff. But you need some initial recommendations. Uh, and also, you know, some users might just not like to rate stuff. You need to give them recommendations as well. That's all part of the cold start problem. Uh, so we have two sources of information that we can include in order to, uh, to help us here. Uh, we can include this implicit information, which is less, well, less explicit. Uh, it's less informative than explicit information because m people have not said explicitly, I like this movie, they've just looked at it, which could mean anything, could mean they hated it, could mean they liked the poster, it could mean they accidentally clicked on something. But it's still a little bit informative, still better than nothing, basically. So maybe it's information that we can uh, derive something from. Uh, so let's start there. Uh, and basically what you do, or the simplest way to, to include um, implicit information in this uh, in this setting, this matrix factorization setting, is to make up a bunch of new factors. So we here we have the M factors, the representing the movies that we already saw. Uh, we make a, a big matrix of the same size, uh, the same width and height. So one vector again for every movie, call it X. And this is going to be our implicit uh, factor uh, representation for the movies. And essentially what we do is we look at the set and you, uh, and you all movies liked implicitly by the user you. So it depends on your system how exactly you're going to fill this in. 
somehow you're gonna figure out what movies are tangentially related to this user u. And then you sum over all the movies in that set, you sum these factor factors. And that's your implicit representation for user u. And again, these factors are the things you're gonna learn. So eventually after we're done learning, these are going to represent our movies in some meaningful way, but that's after learning. For now we just say, we sum it over all this, uh, in these implicit uh, likes, we get an implicit representation of our user, and we sum that to our existing representation of our user. So this is just a factor from, uh, from the, the um, sorry, the column from matrix U. We add our implicit representation to that, and it can help to normalize this, and there's lots of tr tricks you can do to make this better, but for now this is the basic idea. You add this, and the addition of those two, you take the dot product there. And then you optimize your representation X, such that this is close to the data. And if you like, you add the bias factor. Uh, bias terms, sorry. Um, side information is also very useful. So if I know that my user is young, I don't know what the user likes, but I know that he's young, or she's young, or I know that he, uh, I know their gender, I know their country of origin, all these things I can use to <coughs> compare them to other users in my database. Uh, and maybe take over some of their likes. So if they're young, I can recommend them things that other people have liked who are also young. So we assume that there are a couple of attributes uh, that we can course that uh, that course that we know things that we know about user u. Call that a of u. And for now, let's just say that they are all binary features. So they are things that are either true or not true. So I know a bunch of things. I know whether A is male or female, young or old, uh, American or not American, stuff like that. So what we do is we make another matrix of factors, we call it Y this time, which unlike X is not the same size as M, so it's not one factor for each movie, it's one factor for each feature. So we get a factor for all young people, we get a factor for all American people, a factor for all men, etc., etc. And then we do the same thing we did before, we just sum over all the features that are true for this particular user. And that will be our rep uh, representation of the user based on site information. And again, these are all values that we're going to learn. So then we get a representation of the user in three parts, explicit features that we get from the decomposition, Implicit features that we get from the implicit likes and side information features that we get from the side information based on what other users do. And this model together, uh, if we take the dot product of that with Q, it should give us the rating. And again, we uh, these are all learning signals. So if we do a gradient descent on this, we get a gradient here that feeds back into this uh, matrix U, which gives us, which we can optimize directly, or it feeds through these terms, which feed back into the matrix Y and back into the matrix X, and let's optimize those matrices. Uh, so that's side information. Forgot to put this in the plan, but another thing that can be important is uh, time or temporal dynamics, as they call it in the literature. Uh, and you see that most clearly in these plots. This is again the Netflix data. Uh, first, this is the, the the top one is the average ratings or the just ratings uh, plotted against uh, just time, regular time days since the since Netflix started essentially and what you see that as Netflix started it had a basic very reasonable uh, average rating and then suddenly there's a big jump 
And apparently what happened there is that they asked the rating question differently. So I think instead of how much did you like this movie, they asked, asked something like, did you dislike this movie? I'm not sure what the, the change was. But they changed the phrasing. And if you've studied psychology, you know that the phrasing of a question massively influences the outcome. So suddenly the ratings completely changed, which you need to correct for if you're going to use all of this data, right? Because the users kept doing the same thing. They kept liking movies in the same ways. But suddenly it means something completely different. So any data set you're going to have from a, a company that runs over a couple of years is going to have this kind of noise in it that you need to correct for. And another thing that is more domain specific is that if you look at how old a movie is, so not how long a movie's been in the data set, but how long it's been since the movie came out, um, that older movies tend to be ranked more highly. So these are movies from like the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the 80s, and then the 90s and noughties. Uh, so does that mean that old movies are better? Well, not really. It, uh, I mean, maybe it does, but uh, the specific effect you're seeing here is that uh, old movies tend to be more obscure. So new movies, everybody sees them because they've just come out, so everybody sees the new movie that just come out, uh, that's just come out. But older movies, they are sought out specifically by people who remember that movie. So here, people sort of, um, to even watch a movie like this, usually you have to know it already and you have to have a good reason to seek it out. So you're much more likely to rate it highly. So these are all trends that you should take into account. Uh, and one way to do this is to make some terms and factors in your model time dependent. So basically we say the rating is now a function of time, t. The user representation is now a function of time, t, to express that user ratings change over time. The movie is not a function of time, t, the movie representation, so the movie representation stays fixed through time. A romantic movie stays a romantic movie. It doesn't suddenly become a non-romantic movie. Um, the biases do change. So the way in which a movie is viewed uh, can be rephrased and something that is panned when it comes out can suddenly become a cult movie later and be seen in a new light. And user, ch uh, user tastes change over time. So we can model that as well. And the uh, global level we assume stays the same. So what does that mean to make this uh, a function of time? Well, essentially, what it means practically is that you split your data set into chunks. Let's say three chunks to make it easy to plot, uh, to, uh, to diagram. Let's say we split our data set into two chunks of time. And you can do this, for instance, here. You could split it into before the change and after the change in the interface. And we model each independently. So we get one movie vector, because movie is not dependent on time, but we get three different user vectors and three different rating vectors. And that's all that bracket t means. So we don't really tend to model these things as explicitly as a function, like using an LSTM or something. We just split our data set into chunks of time, and we do it separately for each bin. Uh, it is important to remember once you're dealing with time, that validation, your validation approach should change. Because you shouldn't train on data that is in the future uh, of your test set. That, uh, yeah, no, uh, don't, uh, you're not allowed to train on data that comes after your test set. So all training data should come before all validation data, which should come before all test data. That's basically what we talked about in the uh, lecture on Monday. So now we have a lot of um, different approaches. So let's see what, uh, what effect this has. Uh, so here we see the uh, root mean square error, the thing we're trying to optimize. Um, here we see the plane model, the red one. Uh, so that does the worst, and if you add some biases, you can see it drops a little bit. Uh, oh yeah, millions of parameters, that's basically something you can control by setting the size 
of these vectors, right? If you set uh, the, the size of the feature. So how many features are we going to get to uh, represent the users and how many features are we going to get to represent the movies? That determines ultimately how many numbers you get in total in these two matrices, these U and these M matrices. So that gives you a certain million number of parameters. And then if you split by time, you get even more parameters. If you do a big split in lots of time bins, your number of parameters grows even more. But as you can see here, it's worth it. Uh, so this is the biases, they help a little bit. Then it's the, the implicit feedback and the side information. Uh, well, uh, only implicit feedback in this plot, I guess. So this is um, whether users have looked at movies or have uh, done stuff like that. If you include that, you get a big jump. And then if you include these temporal dynamics to uh, factor in these uh, changing nature of the data set, uh, you can see that you can get another big jump, but the number of parameters <coughs> does grow massively. Because for each time slice that you include, you have to learn new a new user matrix. <coughs> so you get massively bigger models, uh, but you do get a, a nice result. And of course, um, yeah, I started out by saying that uh, Netflix had this prize to win a million dollars. So the people, when they wrote this paper, the people who wrote this paper, they were very much at the top of the leaderboard and they were, I think, just a few percentage points <coughs> away from winning the prize, from the threshold uh, required to win the prize. And probably a few months after this paper came out, they actually won it. And they did so not by one of these models, by one of these very elegant singular approaches, but by ensembling. Because all prizes in machine learning are won by ensembles. So they trained a huge amount of different models like this and combined them. So they, not only does each model, uh, model have millions of parameters, they also had a big bag of models. They combined them in clever ways and then they managed to push past this threshold and win the million bucks. So that's matrix factorization. Um, final thing I wanted to discuss is uh, to have another look at PCA principal component analysis, which is a method we talked about in the second week, the methodology two lecture. And again, I um, was slightly pressed for time, so I stole the pictures and the explanation from this blog post. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please have a look at the blog post, maybe he uh, explains it better than I do. So forget about ratings. We're done talking about recommender systems, we're done talking about ratings, and we're back to normal data matrices, that we've, like we've seen them uh, for the past few weeks, except because I didn't draw the pictures myself, the instances and the features are switched around, because Alex Williams draws data matrices like this, so uh, just flip this around by 90 degrees in your head. These are now the instances and these are the features but it's still a basic data matrix like we've seen before. And what PCA does is it reduces, it's a dimensionality reduction method. It reduces the dimensionality of our matrix. So for each in instance, it um, computes a smaller feature vector with fewer dimensions than the dimension of the data set, such that as much information as possible is retained. So here we, uh, see an extre extreme example with just one component. So we reduce the entire data set to one number per instance, one dimension per instance. So this is the original data. This is our reduced uh, representation. And the idea is that there is some uh, other matrix called the loading matrix in this uh, example, such that if you uh, multiply them back together, you get a reconstruction of your data which should be as close as possible to the original data under the constraint that you have these, uh, that it's, uh, that it, that it's uh, the product of two vectors. So this is a different way to think about PCA basically. We have a low rank, um, uh, sorry, we have a small matrix here and a small matrix here and 
multiplying them together should reconstruct our data as closely as possible. Incidentally, if you're using PCA, this is something I didn't talk about earlier, uh, is how to choose the number of components. So this is an example with one component, but this number of components that you retain in PCA is uh, a choice. Usually if you plot either the reconstruction error or maybe if you used in a classification scenario, the downstream, the classification. But if you plot that against the number of components, you usually see this kind of inflection point where it suddenly drops very sharply. And that should tell you how many components. That should tell you that three here, just before the cutoff, just before the inflection point, three components is a good value to use because the first three components contain almost all of the data. And the rest is sort of this long tail of components that add a little bit for every component. So it's something I didn't show you earlier, this is useful to do in PCA if you want to figure out how many components to use. Uh, but let's go, back, let's go back to the one component case. So we just use one component. We project our data into one dimension. And as I said, the idea of PCA is that you choose that component to maximize the variance. So the, when you project your data onto this one dimension, this one component, the variance, how spread out your data is, should be maximized. And it turns out that that objective, maximizing the variance, is actually equivalent to minimizing the residuals. So if you see this component as a line that you're fitting through your data with just residuals, um, like we've used uh, all the time in, in uh, regression, if you minimize the squares of the residuals, uh, in this case, residuals uh, orthogonal to your line, to your component, then that's exactly equivalent to maximizing the variance. Why? So if you look at your point in space, it has some variance, it has some distance to the origin. If you choose your component, then you can see this variance, this distance to the origin, as consisting of two, uh, two vectors, as it were, one along the component and one perpendicular to the component, d1 and d2. And by Pythagoras, d3 is the square of d1 plus the square of d2. So this is constant, this uh, black line that's given, that's just where your data is in space. So when you're choosing this, uh, this dotted line here, when you're choosing where to draw your component, you can either maximize this term, maximize the variance, try and maximize this uh, uh, value, or you can try and minimize this. But because uh, they're related by this relation, uh, it, it boils down to the same thing. So that's why in, in matrix factorization, we talk about the squared error stuff. We talk about squared error loss. And in PCA, we talk about variance reduction, but it's actually the same thing. So the only real difference between PCA now and um, matrix factorization is that in PCA, we made an explicit constraint that these uh, uh, components should all be orthogonal to each other. They should be eigenvectors. And we haven't made that a constraint here explicitly. That's the, only, uh, that's the only difference. And the nice thing that you can do, uh, yeah, just a little notation. This is a, we call this C, we call this W. The nice thing that you can do now is use this least squares objective uh, in the same way we've used any objective so far, and add, for instance, some regularizers. So this is our basic objective that will give us PCA without the orthogonal uh, orthogonality constraint. And then we just add some regularizers to make our representations less big, which is just nice if you do an L2 regularizer, but it's even nicer if you do an L1 regularizer because then you get the sparsity which is a way of enforcing that the representations that you get out of PCA are more interpretable, are more axis aligned. So some of them will be 
explicitly zero or one, which always makes things more interpretable. Uh, there's a picture here, I it's not really clear, but here you get the regular PCA, here you get the sparse version of PCA, and these should be more aligned to the axis and more often zero. Uh, I don't really, I think the picture is very convincing, but basically in some cases this sparse version of PCA will actually get you uh, nicer representations and more interpretable representations. So that's PCA revisited. So summary of what we've talked about today. Uh, when your task consists of linking one large set of things to another large set of things, based on sparse examples, a little intrinsic information, then matrix factorization may be appropriate. So it makes most sense in the context of movies and users, or users and items, but really, what it's a solution for is a situation where you have a big finite set of things here and a big finite set of things here and a couple of links between them. Uh, some links given and some links you want to predict. So tagging news articles or uh, assigning ingredients to, uh, to recipes, all these things can also be used, uh, can also be solved with matrix factorization. Um, as usual, if you deviate from the standard classification or regression setting, in some way remember to check whether you're still validating and testing correctly. And then we talked about um, ways to extend the model using uh, regularization, biases and side information and implicit uh, likes and even temporal dynamics. And then finally we discussed some relations between PCA and matrix factorization. And one thing I forgot to mention, so it's good that I put it here. Uh, PCA, the uh, one big difference between PCA and matrix factorization is that PCA usually operates on a complete matrix, like a data matrix. And matrix factorization is uh, specifically designed for situations like user rating where we have an incomplete matrix, where a matrix is largely incomplete. Finally, before my last slide, one thing I forgot to mention, I wanted to put it somewhere in the slides, but just a word. Collaborative filtering, I should have put that somewhere in the slide. This is also a name for this idea of um, recommender systems using matrix factorization, using existing ratings. Sometimes that's called collaborative filtering. So don't be surprised if you see it referred to as by that name. And that's all I had for today. So thank you for your attention, and I will see you on Monday when we will discuss reinforcement learning. <laughs>